will speak at the end. Yeah. Then uh, Dr. Dhananjay is the next speaker. Uh, he is also highly talented, very young and dynamic and uh, very good academic background. Uh, over to you, Dhananjay. Are you ready? Dhananjay, are you Hello. there? Hello, sir. I am ready, sir. But Chetana, sir, can yeah, I please Dhananjay just will be talking on uh, clinical uh, assessment of uh, IIT stenosis, which is also very, very important from exam point of view. Hello, sir. Can you see the yeah, my slides? Yeah, go to slide show. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, good. Hi, good evening to all teachers, seniors, friends, and my colleagues and juniors. Uh, Today, I will discuss about the clinical assessment of aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis, uh, the ideology of aortic stenosis is uh, uh, classified based on location into supravalular, subvalular, and valvular. And stenosis, it is mainly of three types fibromembranous lesion, focal hourglass constriction, uh -huh. generalized. Yeah? Are you able to hear me? Some disturbances. Any any net connectivity problem is there, Dhananjay? Yes, sir. Uh, are you able to hear me, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Coming to supravalar aortic stenosis, it is mainly of three types. That is fibromembranous lesion, focal hourglass constriction, or a generalized hypoplasia. Usually, the supravalar aortic stenosis is commonly associated with Williams syndrome, which uh, the clinical manifestations will be associated with elfin phases, hypercalcemia, peripheral PS, thrill and palpation, suprasternal notch on right, but not the left carotid artery, and the increased A2. Coming to subvalar aortic stenosis, it is mainly caused by membranous diaphragm or fibromuscular narrowing that is a, a subiotic tunnel deformity or a muscular hypertrophy. And it usually presents with a high Doppler velocity on outflow track with normal aortic valve on echo. And there is a frequent aortic regurgitation due to aortic valve jet. Coming to valvular aortic stenosis, it is mainly caused by congenital, bicuspid, rheumatic or senile degenerative. Congenital valvular aortic stenosis usually presents in one to 30 years old age group, bicuspid aortic valve stenosis usually presents at 40 to 60 years age group, and rheumatic heart disease valvular aortic stenosis presents at 40 to 60 years of age group, and senile degenerative usually presents more than 70 years old. Coming to congenital aortic valve disease, it is mainly bicuspid, tricuspid, or uh, may manifest as a dome shaped diaphragm. Unicuspid valves typically produce a severe obstruction in infancy and are most frequent malformations found in fatal valvular AS in children younger than one year. It may also be seen in young adults with an anatomy that mimics bicuspid valve disease. Coming to bicuspid aortic valve, uh, this is the most common congenital cardiac abnormality affecting 1-2% to 2 of the population. Most affected patients, however, have a normal valve function until late in life when superimposed calcific changes result in valve obstruction. Over time, one-third to half of such valves become stenotic with significant narrowing of the aortic orifice, typically developing in fifth and sixth decades of life. Our main focus is on valvular aortic stenosis. Uh, here you can see in the picture, uh, the normal, uh, the top left one is the normal aortic valve. Uh, the one in the uh, top right is bicuspid aortic valve stenosis. The one on the uh, bottom left corner is the rheumatic uh, Theology, which is showing fused commissures and all, and the bottom right one is showing the tenile calcific degenerative aortic stenosis. Coming to the valve histology, showing progression of the disease, usually uh, there will be the uh, initiating factors such as shear stress, bicuspid aortic valve, and genetic factors. 
they cause an early lesion and there will be uh, the valve structure will be altered with the t cell uh, deposition uh, ldl accumulation oxidized ldl and so uh, the macrophages accumulation these all lead to fibroblast formation and osteoblast formation and so and so how the disease gets progressed based on the as age and age progress age progresses and male sex increased serum lipids and increased blood pressure diabetes and metabolic syndrome and smoking these all lead to disease progression and finally end stage leads to calcification of the aortic valve coming to the key points the three principal causes we already described is the calcification of the normal tricuspid trilateral valve a congenital bicuspid valve with superimposed calcification and the most common cause uh, and the rheumatic heart disease and the most common cause is senile degenerative changes in patients with aortic stenosis due to rheumatic heart disease always rule out uh, silent ms bicuspid or rheumatic uh, etiology should be suspected in a patient with a aortic stenosis presenting in the fifth or sixth decade of life and in patients undergoing aortic valve replacement for aortic stenosis a bicuspid valve was present in more than 50% including two thirds of those younger than 70 years and 40% of those older than 70 years coming to other causes other causes usually congenital valve stenosis we discussed severe, severe atherosclerosis of aorta and aortic valve this is frequently seen in patients with uh, severe hypercholesterolemia and is also observed in children with homozygous type 2 hyperlipoproteinemia and also rheumatoid involvement in rheumatoid arthritis there will be nodular thickening of the valve leaflets and involvement of the proximal portion of the aorta also other causes are ochronosis with alcaptonuria and this is a table showing various causes of valvular and Uh, supra supra valvular and sub valvular stenosis coming to uh, the type of types of obstruction fixed obstruction and dynamic obstruction fixed obstruction to lv outflow may occur above the valve as in supra valvular stenosis at the level of valve in valvular aortic stenosis and below the level of valve in discrete sub valvular stenosis and uh, dynamic sub aortic obstruction may be caused by hypertrophic cardiomyopathy coming to the pathophysiology pathophysiology usually includes mainly three steps there will be increase in afterload there is a decrease in systemic and coronary flow from obstruction and there will be a progressive lv hypertrophy as we see here due to fixed uh, obstruction due to aortic stenosis the lv outflow obstruction occurs which increases the lv systolic pressure so there will be a compensatory increase in lv mass lv hypertrophy and which may uh, ultimately lead to lv dysfunction and due to obstruction there will be a prolonged lv ejection time which increases the myocardial oxygen consumption along with the increased lv mass and there will be a decrease in diastolic time as there is a decrease in diastolic time there will be a decrease in coronary perfusion and decrease in myocardial oxygen supply and uh, the myocardial oxygen supply is also decreased because of an increase in lv diastolic pressures and a decrease in aortic pressure these all lead to myocardial ischemia and ultimately finally leading to lv failure Uh, usually no measure, measurable gradient develops until the aortic valve area is reduced by 50% and physiological compensation is by increase in pressure generated by left ventricle and prolongation of systolic ejection period and anatomic compensation is by increase in contractile mass and what are the consequences of compensatory mechanisms due to left ventricular hypertrophy there will be increased valve stiffness and impaired myocardial relaxation and due to this there will be a reduced lv diastolic compliance and the late diastolic filling needs increased force of atrial contraction which gives a prominent s4 this is called an atrial kick which is a prominent s4 and in patients with atrial fibrillation and heart blocks this atrial kick is lost and they rapidly progress to heart failure coming to the compensatory mechanisms the because of increase the compensatory mechanisms are left ventricular hypertrophy increased lv pressures and prolongation of systole and the consequences are increased myocardial oxygen consumption duration of diastole is limited and coronary blood flow is compromised acute imbalance can occur in patients with aortic stenosis these may be because of anginal attacks paroxysmal arrhythmias and episodes of non arrhythmic power failure and the chronic imbalance is mainly due to patchy myocardial fibrosis abnormal left ventricular ejection fraction and this leads to reduced intrinsic myocardial function reduced preload and preload afterload mismatch coming to the uh, symptoms there will be a classic symptomatic triad which is called the uh, symptomatic the symptomatic triad is dyspnea angina and dizziness or syncope coming to the dyspnea this is the most common symptom there will be a gradual decrease in exercise tolerance fatigue or dyspnea on exertion 
and if the patient goes into lv failure there will be a cough pnd on ex- uh, progressive dyspnea on exertion pnd and arthapnea angina angina is usually present in two thirds of patients with severe aortic stenosis half of these patients have high grade coronary artery disease more than 70% stenosis and there will be a reduced coronary reserve or reduced vas- coronary vasodilatory capacity due to failure of coronary microvasculature to grow apace with the increased left ventricular mass and increased myocardial demand decreased subendocardial supply and enhanced susceptibility to su- supply and de- demand imbalance is present and coming to dizziness and syncope it is usually present in 15 to 30% of symptomatic patients this results mainly from abrupt fall in cardiac output during effort without compensatory increase in systemic vascular resistance and there will be abrupt fall in systemic vascular resistance system due to systemic vasodilatation in the presence of a fixed cardiac output and an arrhythmia a transient af or av block may cause syncope predominantly this syncope may occur at rest and coming to others other symptoms they are usually due to atrial fibrillation pulmonary hypertension systemic venous hypertension and infective endocarditis and sometimes coronary emboli- uh, uh, sometimes uh, systemic embolization may occur the calcific uh, not small calcific spect may embolize into the uh, brain and uh, gi bleeding gi bleeding this is usually due to angiodysplasia of colon usually 25 to 30% of patients with gi bleed in whom source cannot be identified there might be an underlying aortic stenosis the right colon is the most common location it is mainly caused by shear stress induced platelet aggregation with a reduction in high molecular weight multimers of one willebrand factor and increase in proteolytic subunit fragments and once any of these classical symptoms develop prognosis dramatically worsens here you can see in the right diagram once after the onset of symptoms severe symptoms usually the mean survival is with the onset of angina uh, uh, with the onset of angina the usually Uh, the survival is only 5 years with onset of uh, syncope usually the survival is 3 years and with onset of congestive heart failure the mean survival is only 2 years coming to the clinical examination usually uh, this is a child show, uh, showing uh, uh, which this is a child who manifests the, all the features of majority of the features of uh, william syndrome he has flat uh, broad high forehead puffy cheeks low set ears ocular hypertelorism with strabismus underdeveloped nasal bones with upturned philtrum wide pouting mouth dental abnormalities and hypoplastic mandible this is also another child not uh, as typical as the previous one this is also another child with william syndrome coming to the pulse the pulse is usually slow rising this is called pulses parvus there will be a delayed peak this is pulses tardus the volume will be small volume there will be a palpable thrill in the carotids and there will be a prominent anacrotic notch which is usually not palpable here you can see that you, in the left side the diagram you can see that there is uh, there will be a slow rise of the pulse and this is called pulses parvus and tardus and here in the right side also you can see uh, in the middle one the second one you can see uh, there will be a slow rise and there will be a small plateau and in the extreme th- third image you can see there will be an anacrotic notch in the bottom image also you can see the pulse tracing showing anacrotic notch and this is a normal uh, patient uh, carotid pulse tracing uh, in a normal and aortic stenosis patients here you can see there will be a carotid shudder and what are the pitfalls in evaluating the arterial pulse in aortic stenosis factors that can normalize the arterial pulse and mask the apparent severity are high cardiac output and elastic vessels in children and young patients uh, they can normalize the arterial pulse and the increased stiffness of the vessels in the elderly associated aortic regurgitation uh, because of the bisferent pulse which may be present and associated systemic hypertension low stroke volume of chf there the uh, pulse can be normalized and they mask the apparent severity of as and factors that can exaggerate the apparent severity of as are decreased lv function hypovolemia and mitral stenosis they can exaggerate the severity of ms based on the pulse tracing from the pulse alternance here you can see uh, pulse alternance in the tracings it is present in patients with severe as with lv dysfunction and coming to supravalvular as there in supravalvular as there will be selective jet streaming of blood into the right innominate artery so there will be a greater pulse amplitude in the right subclavian right brachial and right carotid arteries and usually the right arm bp 
is more 10 to 20 millimeters more than the left arm BP. Coming to the blood pressure, usually the systolic blood pressure and pulse pressure are usually decreased. If the pulse pressure is less than 30 millimeters of mercury, then you must suspect severe aortic stenosis in the patient. And uh, the blood pressure may be normal or increased in patients with severe AS if there is associated aortic regurgitation or older patients with increased inelastic arterial blood bed. Coming to the jugular venous pressure, the jugular A wave is prominent in the absence of elevated mean JVP. This is due to decreased right ventricular compliance in the setting of hypertrophied left ventricle chamber and septum. This is called Bernheim effect. And if biventricular failure is present, mean jugular venous pressure is elevated. Coming to the precardial motion, there will be usually sustained LV lift will be present. This is the duration and force of LV impulse is increased. And uh, the usually the LV lift is sustained into second half of the systole. And coming to the palpable A wave may be present. Uh, there, this is due to pre-systolic distension of LV. It may be visible and palpable. If the palpable A wave is present, then usually the LV diato gradient is more than 70 millimeters of mercury. And you must suspect a severe AS if there is a palpable A wave. And a hyperdynamic left ventricle may suggest a concomitant AR or MR. Coming to the palpation uh, continued, uh, systolic thrill may be present, which will be best appreciated when the patient leans forward during full expiration. It is palpated more readily in the second right intercostal space of the suprasternal notch, and frequently it is transmitted along the carotid arteries. A systolic thrill is specific for severe AS, but may not be sensitive. Also, apico-carotid delay. A lag between the onset of apical impulse and the carotid impulse may be present in cases of severe AS and if it is present, it predicts that the valve area is less than 1 square centimeter, which is 100% specific. Coming to the auscultation, usually uh, uh, aortic area is considered as right second uh, intercostal space, but as per Jules constant, he says that as the uh, regurgitation murmurs are also heard and aortic stenosis murmurs are heard up to the apex, uh, usually the whole shash area, this, this, uh, this should be considered as a aortic area. Coming to the first heart sound, an auscultation, it is usually undemarkable. Nanjay, sorry for disturbing. Nanjay, you sir. just keep your video on because we are unable to see you. As you you sir. continue. If your camera sir, sir. is not on. Okay, okay. continue. Okay, sir. Uh, the first heart sound is usually unremarkable. Uh, it is uh, the first heart sound may be low if in a patient with aortic stenosis if the S1 is loud then suspect presence of an aortic ejection sound or associated MS S1 may be decreased in amplitude when left ventricular diastolic pressure is high or left ventricular contractility is impaired in patients with aortic stenosis and congestive heart failure S1 is soft as a result of both of these mechanisms coming to the aortic ejection sound Aortic ejection sound usually occurs at the end of isovolumetric contra isovolumic contraction that is 40 to 80 milliseconds after M1. This aortic ejection sound is seen only in valvular aortic stenosis and most often it is heard best at the apex. It doesn't vary with inspiration. If the presence of aortic ejection sound is there, then you must suspect bicuspid aortic valve without stenosis or of aortic valve the louder the sound the more mobile the valve is and absence of ejection sound in valvular aortic stenosis implies the calcified valve with a gradient of more than 50 millimeters of mercury coming to the bicuspid aortic valve bicuspid aortic valve uh, high frequency high amplitude sound will be, will be present as a aortic ejection sound is common in bicuspid aortic valve this is due to sudden cessation of the abnormal uh, opening of the abnormal leaflets due to doming Coming to the second heart sound, this is the second heart sound is normally split into A2 and P2. Uh, with uh, inspiration, there will be a uh, uh, delayed P2 and there, uh, A2 may occur early only mildly. The, only the delayed P2 component uh, contributes to two-thirds of the splitting of the S2. Coming to the intensity of A2, in aortic stenosis, it may be normal or increased in cases of pliable thin leaflets such as congenital AS without calcification or older patients with aortic calcification and coexisting systemic hypertension. And as thickening and rigidity 
of the calcification ensues the amplitude of a2 decreases and amplitude of aortic ejection sound and that of a2 are closely related coming to the splitting of s2 there will be a delayed a2 this is due to increased duration of lv ejection here in the right side figure you can see uh, this is uh, the delayed a2 in aortic stenosis is mainly due to prolonged time for the lv pressure to drop below the aortic pressure at end systole due to large lv aortic gradient and coming to the paradoxical splitting paradoxical splitting indicates that the lv to aorta gradient is more than 75 mm mercury and this simplifies uh, that there is a severe aortic stenosis usually the split that widens on expression and this is a paradoxical splitting is the split that widens on expression and narrows on inspiration here in older patients here in the right side figures you can see uh, the split widens on expression and narrows on inspiration Uh, and in older patients with moderate to severe as uh, two thirds of patients have single s2 and only 20 to 25% have a paradoxical split coming to third heart sound s3 in aortic stenosis suggests left ventricular dysfunction or overt congestive heart failure when s3 is heard look, uh, look for any evidence of lv dilatation as well as pulses alternates and lv impulse is often displaced laterally in these cases and s3 may be palpable in early diastole this may be normal in children and young adults with congenital as of less than 40 years coming to s4 s4 is a clue to the presence of left ventricular hypertrophy and decreased lv compliance but only in younger patients and the presence of an audible or palpable s4 usually correlates with lv to aorta gradient of more than 70 mm this mercury and abnormally elevated lv and diastolic pressures and s4 may be normal in young children and older patients with coexisting cad or hypertension and audible s4 if it is present as may not may or may not be severe but the palpable s4 it clearly says that the aortic stenosis is severe and coming to the murmur the murmur is a classic systolic ejection murmur it starts it is a crescendo decrescendo murmur it starts after s1 and ends before s2 as you can see in the right side figure it is usually harsh rough or grunting coarse sounding like a person clearing his throat and it is usually maximal at the second right intercostal space can be maximal at left second or third intercostal space also it is which is called as point and the murmur usually radiates upwards and to the right it is often well heard over both carotids it not only radiates to the right clavicle but also amplified there remember a murmur louder over the carotid than on the clavicle is should be considered a local arterial mur murmur instead of aortic stenosis murmur and in general louder the murmur of aortic stenosis the more severe is the valvular obstruction and in copd obesity or big chest auscultate at the base with the patient upright and really leaning forward and in the presence of congestive heart failure and coexisting ms uh, a grade 3 to 4 murmur suggests severe as and assessing the severity of uh, aortic stenosis based on the murmur the length of murmur is usually proportional to the severity of the obstruction and the time to peak the intensity of the murmur is a better indicator of severity of aortic stenosis than its overall length here you can see in the right side figure the time to, as the severity of uh, aortic stenosis increases the time to peak of the mur to reach the peak intensity of the murmur is slowly uh, delaying so uh, in lv dysfunction or congestive heart failure the murmur may shorten and occasionally may disappear here you can see uh, in mild as the murmur is only early and in the severe case as the murmur uh, the length of the murmur is increased the time to take the peak intensity of the murmur is increased and also the uh, there is paradoxical split of s2 here this is a carotid pulse tracing and a phonocardiogram tracings which show that uh, in the right side uh, which shows that severe uh, severe ms severe as and in the, on the left side it is severe mild as uh in severe as you can see there is a slow rise and uh, anacrotic uh, notch and the murmur is the time to peak uh, attain the peak intensity of the murmur is delayed and coming to the galavardin dissociation galavardin dissociation it is seen in aortic stenosis usually two murmurs are heard the impure noisy murmur is heard at the base which is harsh and is due to the turbulent jet Uh, and the apical systolic murmur it is high pitched musical seagull or queen quality it is due to vibrations of the uh, fibro fibrotic uh, fibrocalcific aortic valve 
here in the right side tracing you can see in the mo tracing you can see that the uh, there are vibrations of the aortic valve in the open position and coming to the effect of uh, premature ventricular complexes or cycle length and murmur when premature ventricular complexes are followed by pauses longer than the dominant cycle length the apical mid systolic murmur of aortic stenosis or sclerosis it increases in intensity in the long cycle length beat following the pvc whereas the murmur of mitral regurgitation remains relatively unchanged the same pattern follows the long cycle length in aortic in the atrial fibrillation here you can see in aortic stenosis after a pvc in the left image after a pvc you can see there is augmentation of the systolic murmur in the next beat and uh, whereas in mr there is no such changes coming to aortic sclerosis aortic sclerosis may also cause a a uh, short ejection systolic murmur uh, the, uh, usually a calcium spur or thickened aortic cusp or an atheromatic atheromatous plaque in the ascending aorta these may cause a short systolic murmur this also follows the same rule as uh, uh, in the long cycle length beat after a vpc and if there is associated ar usually associated ar is common in rheumatic heart disease ar present in valvular and discrete subvalvular as but ar is absent in supravalvular as and hcm the rigid contracted and often calcified valve may be truly immobile and unable to adequately open or close and this may cause aortic regurgitation uh, usually specifically specifically listen for blowing diastolic murmur in all patients with aortic stenosis with sitting up and leaning forward position with breath held in expression using firm pressure with diaphragm of the stethoscope and presence of aortic regurgitation it augments the stroke volume and further it may increase the intensity and length of aortic stenosis murmur if this is the effects of interventions on systolic murmurs this uh dr Ch chaitanya has already elaborated uh, uh at the effect of interventions on systolic murmurs uh, so i am bypassing this slide and coming to the differential diagnosis usually aortic sclerosis or systolic murmur of elderly this is due to stiffening of the basal aspects of the leaflets and the murmur is classic of aortic stenosis murmur but usually less than grade 4 by 6 and at is typically well preserved keratids have a brisk up stroke and there is no evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy and palpation and length and peak of intensity of murmur fall within the first half of the systole coming to mitral regurgitation the mitral regurgitation murmur usually radiates well to axilla and usually they will have a normal keratid pulse this uh, uh, dynamic auscultation has already been discussed and uh, the combined valvular lesions i am going to skip these in view of limited time because uh, tomorrow another topic is there of combined valvular lesions coming to the differential diagnosis of aortic stenosis based on history usually that based on the type of stenosis usually acquired non rheumatic acquired rheumatic hypertrophic subaortic and congenital valvular congenital subvalvular and congenital supravalvular and uh, different based on the how do you differentiate the various differential like based on the physical findings acquired non rheumatic valvular aortic stenosis usually the murmur maximum will be heard in the second right intercostal space sternal border to neck and maybe Uh, at apex in the aged people and uh, aortic uh, ejection sound is usually absent aortic component of the second heart sound is decreased or absent and regurgitant diastolic murmur may be present and arterial pulse is usually delayed upstroke anacrotic notch and usually a small a small amplitude uh, in acquired rheumatic aortic stenosis also it may be same in uh, the aortic ejection sound is also uncommon Uh, the aortic component of the second heart sound is decreased or absent regurgitant diastolic murmur is common and in hypertrophic subaortic uh, wall subaortic stenosis usually the murmur will be maximum in the fourth left intercostal space sternal border to apex and uh, uh, the aort there will be uh, no aortic ejection sound aortic component of the second heart sound is usually normal or decreased regurgitant diastolic murmur is very rare and there will be arterial pulse is usually brisk upstroke sometimes disturbance pulse may be present coming to congenital valvular stenosis uh, the murmur is uh, more common in the second right intercostal space from the sternal border to neck along the left sternal border in some infants and it is very common in children disappearing with a decrease in valve mobility with age uh, the aortic ejection sound is very common uh, and disappears with a decrease in valve mobility and uh, aortic component of second heart sound is usually normal or increased in childhood whereas uh, and decreased with decrease in valve mobility with age and uh, the arterial pulse is usually delayed upstroke anacrotic notch and small amplitude and coming to congenital subvalvular aortic stenosis usually in if the, the murmur uh, if it is a tunnel like deformity discrete type 
the murmur is common in the left sternal border aortic ejection sound is rarely heard aortic component of second heart sound it is not helpful because it may be normal increased or decreased or absent and regurgitant diastolic murmur usually almost all patients with subvalvular congenital subvalvular aortic stenosis usually have regurgitant diastolic murmur coming to congenital supravalvular aortic stenosis the murmur will be maximum in the first right intercostal space sternal border to neck and sometimes to the medial aspect of the right arm also occasionally it may be greater in the neck than in the chest and uh, usually the aortic ejection sound will be rarely present and the uh, aortic component of second heart sound will be normal or decreased regurgitant diastolic murmur is usually uncommon in supravalvular as and the pulse will be rapid upstroke in right carotid delayed in left carotid and right arm pulse greater than left arm uh, coming to this i conclude the clinical assessment of aortic stenosis i am confined to aortic stenosis and coming to the mcqs uh, abnormalities of left left ventricular function and hemodynamics in asymptomatic as include all except normal cardiac output at rest elevated lv edp elevated L, lv end diastolic volume increased a wave in the left atrial pressure wave, pressure curve and normal lv stroke volume the answer is elevated lv end diastolic volume and this is a 80 year old man who presents with syncope during evaluation a systolic murmur is auscultated and an echo done and continuous wave doppler through aortic valve is shown here the uh, ajv is 5 meters per second approximately which of the following statements is not correct a gradual increase in exercise tolerance or dyspnea on exertion is the earliest manifestation it is correct up to 50% of this uh, patients with this condition who describe typical angina do not have significant cad syncope commonly occurs without significant change in systemic vascular tone and orthopnea pnn and pulmonary edema are late manifestations gi bleeding has been noted with this disorder syncope commonly occurs uh, with, with significant change in vascular tone systemic vascular resistance decreases and which of the following statements regarding the natural history of untreated aortic stenosis is correct average survival from onset of syncopal symptom is approximately 6 months average survival from the onset of chf is approximately 2 years syncope due to as usually occurs at rest sudden death in patients with aortic stenosis occurs usually occurs in previous asymptomatic individuals af is usually well tolerated average survival from the onset of chf is approximately 2 years usually syncope in due to a, uh, as occurs on exertion if syncope occurs at rest it is may be due to atrial fibrillation or transient av block coming to all are fe- other next question all are features of severe aortic stenosis except delayed carotid upstroke presence of palpable s4 paradoxical splitting of s2 louder murmur peak of murmur in the first third of systole usually murmur peaks in the later third of systole what which is true in gallavadin phenomenon impure noisy murmur systolic murmur is heard at apex pure musical systolic murmur heard at base seen in severe calcific as with immobile valves murmur is due to high frequency vibrations of mobile fibrocalcific cusps following pvc apical systolic murmur decreases in intensity in long cycle length beat usually impure noisy systolic murmur is heard at base and pure musical systolic murmur is heard at apex and it is Mm, uh, seen in uh, mobile valves relatively mobile valves due to high frequency vibrations of fibrocalcific valve cusps and following pvc apical systolic murmur increases in intensity after the long cycle death good dhananjay excellent speech thank you very much and uh, uh, you have covered all aspects of uh, aortic stenosis particularly exam point of view i think everybody spoke very well and uh, these are very useful to the exam going students and all professors i think we are keep uh, we are going to keep these lectures in youtube you can also access later and now almost 200 uh, attendees for this one webinar and uh, though it's very lengthy but uh, it's very very useful to them uh, from exam point of view and uh, they have covered uh, most almost all important points from exam point of view really i think uh, all of you have put in the best effort uh, dr shailendra sir any comment unmute sir unmute dr vijay kumar ready your lecture excellent lecture and uh, very good i think all the uh, uh, 
quality presentation have done an excellent job on yeah, excellent job clinical yeah. evaluation of valvular heart disease excellent job i think uh, we should uh, uh, we are going to keep this one in youtube anybody can access it any time i yeah. think a real quality presentations you have uh, it's a very commendable job i think uh, all aspects covered from clinical symptom differential diagnosis dynamic auscultation all points uh, very well covered for every clinical condition i think uh, now we'll move on to the next topic uh, dr rajaram